it's not. Okay. Here. So I'm gonna mess it up. I apologize, I was late. Um, good afternoon. So uh, we could uh, call the uh, Environmental Commission uh, meeting to order on Tuesday, October 8th. The clerk can call the roll. Uh, Commissioner Bealy? Here. Commissioner Herco? Here. Commissioner Horn? Here. Chairman Davidson? Present. Commissioner Kaufman? Here. Commissioner Rafak? Here. Commissioner Riggs? Here. Uh, Commissioner Rodriguez? Present. Thank you. And motion to approve the minutes uh, from the last uh, commission. I have or a, last two. No, I have a motion before we get started on the agenda. I uh, would like to make a motion to remove items five and seven. They're inappropriate for the environmental commission because they have uh, have to do with funding. That's not part of our uh, part of our mission. Uh, we have nothing to do with, with, with the funding. I think that's more appropriately directed to the city council or whatever committee they, uh, they uh, wish to put it in. But it doesn't belong on our, our agenda. Second to the motion and discussion. Okay, there's been a motion made and seconded um, discussion. I guess it's just a, um, just a, just a, a point that Allison had sent this agenda to me in advance, and I reviewed it and um, said it looked good to me. So that's not to say that it is good. I'm just letting the commission know that I did have this in advance and let Allison know that it was uh, it, it looked okay to me. So, I'm sure it was just an oversight. So uh, as um, insofar as that goes, since you brought the motion, um, if you want to speak to your motion. It's, it's inappropriate because it's not part of our mission. Our mission is to uh, find a sustainable source of water that has is quality and, uh, uh, and is affordable. That's, that's what, uh, it's, it's really a three-legged stool, not a four-legged stool. So I, I believe it's appropriate to remove those items. It's not that they're not, uh, shouldn't be discussed, it's just not a, our purview to discuss them. Shouldn't be part of uh, our agenda. It isn't part of our mission. And Mr. Chairman, if I may add, uh, I want to talk about funding and I want to talk about grants, but I would feel more comfortable if the City Council Finance Committee or another joint meeting with our commission and the Council as we did on the 23rd of April and the 31st of July. So we can all hear this considerable volume of information at the same time. I think that would be a, a more appropriate setting. Here again. Um, we can add that to the motion. Can I add that to the motion? Well, there's been a, a motion so we made. Have to make another one? You're asking to amend the motion. Um, so as long as the party that is uh, seconding the motion approves of your, um, the original party amending the motion, then the motion can be amended. Would you, since you're making that point, Alder, or Alderman. No, uh, it's not Commissioner, Chicago. <laughs> Commissioner Herco, uh, is, 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 that, uh, is that acceptable? Sure, sure it is. So why don't we restate the motion just for the, uh, for the, uh, for the record? Motion to remove items five and uh, seven uh, to be discussed at a joint meeting with the uh, city council or whatever committee they deem appropriate. Um, is there any um, discussion relative to that motion? I think I think I'd, I'd only be hesitant if uh, are we able to have that meeting before the December recommendation meeting, and so that seems to be coming up a little bit soon. Uh, so the only way I see this, I, I, I overall, I think that makes sense. It's just I see this as an opportunity to get that information out there. That uh, so I would only be concerned if there wouldn't be the way to do that otherwise uh, before December. Well, we do have we do have another way to get it out. We have a, a PR company that uh, does that. Well, I would have to object. We're here today. I know the education topics have been pretty consistent with uh, the process that we've been going through 
I'm not opposed of listening to the funding options, and I'm still not opposed of the City Council also listening to those two in the future. But we're all here today. I know they have the presentation prepared, the educational materials. I had, I had the opportunity to go through uh, the material that was sent out. I'm hopeful everyone else did as well. And you guys come prepared with those questions uh, and for the presentation today. So we, I would object. We have no authority to question the funding. I, I mean, it's it's an educational that. topic. Okay. We're not voting on any funding source here today. Uh, it's an educational topic to make sure that we're well knowledgeable about the decision that we have to make. I don't foresee this being inappropriate uh, for us to be able to learn more uh, about the funding options that are there and grant options that are available uh, when making this uh, ultimate decision. So, call, I guess I'm... Call a vote. Well, uh, I'd I, like to speak first, if I could. Yeah. Um, this came out of the blue, so I've only had a couple minutes to think about it, but I don't know that I agree with the premise that funding is not relevant to what we're doing here. The reason we have not yet made a recommendation to council is because we're waiting on the funding or the cost studies. The costs studies. The cost of the studies. And that will have a bearing on what we decide, whether it's it a large portion or a small portion. It's an interesting perspective. I guess I'm kind of coming from the same perspective as um, Commissioner Biley. I mean, we're looking at um, sustainability, um, the um, availability, um, and certainly when making a recommendation to the council, um, uh, cost is always going to be a factor. And insofar as we're looking at funding strategies for cost, um, we are simply a recommending body. The, the council is going to approve uh, whatever it is they're going to approve, and they're free to uh, reject or, um, or agree with whatever we have to say. So I, I, I'm, I, I didn't talk to either one of you guys in advance about this. I, I don't understand how funding isn't relevant. I didn't say it isn't relevant. I said it was not appropriate for this commission. Funding is is the way to get the cost done. Hey, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. It's just a, it's just my my view, my perception. I didn't know it was part of our mission. I, I stand corrected if that's the case. I'm struggling with the difference between appropriate and relevant, and uh, it's not appropriate to this commission. It's very relevant but not to this commission. It's not part of our mission to find the, fun, to find the uh, source, <clears throat> source of water. Well, I can just say, I'll talk about just about anything. So whatever <laughs> is decided, I'll talk about it. Sure. But um, yeah. I, I have to agree with Commissioner Horn from the very beginning. I was under the impression that once we submit our recommendation, um, it's up to the council. Um, to discuss what they can afford, and, and and that's something I feel is just more appropriate with the finance committee or the committee of the whole. Either way, I can understand that. Anything further? Um, I, I guess I suppose it's it's part of the equation. It's you know um, if. You know, so we started to get some numbers in the last meeting, which I appreciated. I watched that, and, and that was that, that was good to finally hear. And I know Bruce, you were taught you're um, appreciative of that. Uh, what I would say, though, is theoretically, if one of these options costs five times more than the other, that's something I'd like to know as we're discussing it. You know, and, and I think that's a consideration. Do I think that's the case? No, but it's just it's a factor, and I think we should be as best informed sure. as we can. Um. Okay. Um. Allison, do you have anything that would be germane to, to, to this at all? I'll just say that the information to be presented is general information about funding opportunities. It does not identify a specific funding strategy, which would then be developed over the course of the next year once the recommend, recommended alternative um, or the alternative is, is selected. So uh, I'll just state that the information is general about okay. funding options. Um, I'll just end with this. I, um, I intend to um, vote against the, removing it. <clears throat> I think the 
overall purpose of the Environmental Commission is to provide um, transparency to the public and to provide them with uh, information and funding. And this may be one of the only opportunities for the general public to participate um, in this process um, before the city council begins to make a decision. So uh, the more information that we can have um, as to how we're gonna pay for this, I think is um, uh, relevant. Uh, this being undefined at this point because we haven't decided on which option that we're gonna suggest to the council, I think that is relevant. So, but at any rate, uh, roll call. Commissioner Bealey. Nay. Commissioner Hurtko? Yay. Commissioner Horn? Yay. Chairman Davidson? No. Commissioner Kaufman? Nay. Commissioner Rafak? Nay. Commissioner Riggs? No. Commissioner Rodriguez? No. All right. Um, approval of minutes. I believe we have two sets of minutes to approve. The last time there was not a uh, meeting minutes available for the prior meeting. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the prior two meetings? So Oops. moved. I think you might have to do them individually. Individually? Individually. Okay. So first, uh, we'll approve the uh, August 13th meeting minutes. Motion to approve the August 13th minutes. Motion or, to amend. Motion to amend. Just if Ann would just add on number nine, uh, the discussion about the leakage of the uh, radioactive water from the Dresden power plant. That's the only thing I see uh, missing. Okay, so if that's acceptable, everyone. So we'll accept that as a friendly amendment to the main minutes that Dr. Herko further uh, raised questions about the, uh, what was the exact language? Radioactive water. Radioactive water. Right. From Dresden. From Dresden, leaking, yes. Okay. Uh, with that amendment, uh, is there a motion to approve? Sure. Uh, I make the motion. And seconded? I second it. Okay, motion made and seconded. Roll call. Commissioner Bealey? Aye. Commissioner Hurtko? Aye. Commissioner Horn? Aye. Chairman Davidson? Aye. Commissioner Kaufman? Aye. Commissioner Rafak? Aye. Commissioner Riggs? Aye. Commissioner Rodriguez? Um, I will note um, uh, Chairman Davidson and Commissioner Kaufman were not present. Oh, I'll, so. um, th I'll amend mine to uh, abstain. Abstain, thank you. I abstain. As well. Thank you. Uh, and uh, September 10th, any amendments to that before we make a motion to approve? Let me just add an I for the approval. Oh, sorry. Can you grab me in there? Thank you. It's September 10th, uh, motion to approve? So moved. Okay, motion made. Second? Second. Seconded. Uh, roll call. Um, and just as a reminder, Commissioner Hurtko and Commissioner Kaufman were not present. Uh, Commissioner Bealey? Aye. Um, Commissioner Hurtko? Absent. Commissioner? Abstain. Abstain. Commissioner Horn? Aye. Chairman Davidson? Aye. Commissioner Kaufman? Abstain. Commissioner Rafak? Aye. Commissioner Riggs? Aye. Commissioner Rodriguez? Aye. Thank you. Uh, item three is citizens to be heard. For those who have not been here in the uh, past, we uh, provide this as kind of a, a form by which you can uh, interact throughout the course of the proceedings. If you have something to say, Please raise your hand. Uh, we need you to come up and identify who you are, if you're with some, some uh, organization, and um, your address uh, so that we can appropriately log that in the minutes. Uh, we also will give an opportunity at the end of the meeting. If someone has something um, that they'd like to say now, I'll also give that opportunity. But just know that you can continue to interact with us during the course of the meeting. Does anybody like to be heard now? They need to leave? Okay. Moving on. Uh, discussion, alternative water source study status, and schedule update, Allison. Okay, uh, thank you. Welcome everyone to our October meeting. Um, as we always do, I will just quickly run through the study schedule and, and the items we've accomplished since the last meeting. Um, so again, we are working on the phase two study. We are looking at the detailed analysis of the five options that were selected in phase one. This includes um, identification of the improvements and the associated costs with each alternative and also a refinement and prioritization of the criteria that have been identified for um, decision-making purposes. And uh, finally, at the end of this, the study, uh, we 
will look to present the results uh, to the Commission and City Council and ultimately have the selection of the alternative water source. Um, as a reminder, these are the five alternatives that we have been studying as part of phase two. Just a map showing the locations of those uh, five alternatives. And again, the goals, um, which I have mentioned previously, some of them determining the improvements required in the life cycle costs, re refining and prioritize, prioritizing decision criteria, making sure our stakeholders are engaged um, through a number of public relations activities that we have held, and then providing the information necessary to the Environmental Commission and City Council. Okay, so items completed since the last Environmental Commission meeting. Uh, another, the last round of river water sampling was performed on September 12th. The river water sampling results uh, were then submitted to IEPA for their review and determination uh, about which treatment, uh, which type of treatment would be required um, for the river water uh, options. We held a conference call with the Indiana Department of Environmental Management. This was done on September 27th. The purpose of that call was to further understand uh, permitting and any regulatory requirements related to the uh, new Indiana intake option. Um, we held a meeting with the city of Chicago on October 1st, and representatives are here today from the city of Chicago to make a presentation. Um, and lastly, we compiled the responses from the community and industry regional water questionnaires. Um, these questionnaires were um, distributed to other communities in the region as well as industry to help gain an understanding of what level of interest there is in potentially having a, a regional solution versus um, just providing water to the city of Joliet. Okay, items anticipated to be completed the next month. We will be meeting with IEPA and US EPA on October 15th. This meeting is to um, discuss, begin discussing the procedures necessary to switch water sources. Um, we also are going to begin the independent cost review. Um, as was mentioned at previous meetings, uh, CDM Smith has been selected to perform that independent cost review and that information will be submitted to them um, in mid-October. And then finally, we're gonna prepare the final report, which will then be presented um, at the joint meeting in November. All right, uh, public relations activities. So in the past month, the, we had a presentation um, at the Illinois Potable Water Operators Association, um, and then upcoming, we are going to make a presentation to the Chamber of Commerce on October 24th, and I will just put it out there that if there are any organizations that would like to have um, a representative from the city make a presentation regarding the city's water study, we are very open to doing that. We have um, already been to many neighborhood associations and other um, professional groups that are um, heavily involved in Joliet. Um, also, as you've been going driving around town, um, hopefully you've been seeing the billboards. Um, this month we are um, um, emphasizing the importance of water conservation on the billboards. We've also had um, more social media posts, 10 in September and eight are scheduled for October. Um, the e-blasts are continuing to be um, sent out, um, notifying um, stakeholders about the Environmental Commission meetings and also um, the meetings are, are being televised on Channel 6. All right, so next month is uh, uh, November and we are looking to um, identify a date for the Joint City Council and Environmental Commission workshop. This would be the workshop where we would present the phase two study results. Um, originally we had intended to have this meeting on November 12th, which is the date of the next Environmental Commission meeting. Um, however, there is a conflict with another um, City Council committee that meets on, on Tuesdays. So we are looking um, to have that on the 13th um, but would like to confirm that there would be um, majority of the commission participation available on that date. That's a Wednesday, is that right? That is, that is a Wednesday. I probably wouldn't be able to be there, but I'll, I'll, I'll check and see. Presumably in the evening? Uh, yes, we'd be looking at, at, again, five to seven, which has been what we've been doing for the, the, the joint workshops. What was that date? It's Wednesday, November 13th. Oh yeah, that was in the email you sent. Yes. Okay. 
Okay, well, I'm not hearing any major objections, so I will confirm with the city council that they're available that day and then proceed with, with scheduling that. Um, we would then cancel the November 12th Environmental Commission meeting. What time would the meeting be? Uh, we would have it uh, beginning at five. Thank you. Maybe <coughs> late. All right, so our, our next steps, um, as I just mentioned, we will have the present presentation of the phase two study at the joint workshop tentatively scheduled for November 13th. Um, again, we are looking for to set a date for a public forum. This would be an opportunity for the um, public to provide their input um, after hearing the phase two study results. Uh, again, we're looking at Thursday, December 5th. And again, this would be a joint meeting with the city council and the en environmental commission um, to obtain the input from the public. So if I would proceed with confirming with the city council of December 5th, Fifth will work for them if there's no objections from the Environmental Commission. Same time, five to seven? Yes. Okay. You're gonna send out a memo on that, right? Yes, um, as soon as I receive confirmation from the mayor and council that those dates are agreeable, I will um, update uh, the Outlook meeting um, calendar. All right, and then the- so we, we have a question. Oh, yes. Bruce. Runwood 1508 West Acres Road, Joliet. Will there be financial numbers available before that meeting on the 5th? The uh, financial Public information receipt. will be presented on November 13th. So that, okay, so on the 13th, we'll see all the dollars yes. and cents for all the options. That's correct. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, and then at the Environmental Commission, which is the regularly scheduled meeting on December 10th, we would have discussion and seek a recommendation um, to make to the city council, and then that would be presented to the city council on December 17th. All right, if there's not any questions about the study in general, I will turn it over to- I have a question. Oh. There was a meeting that you were gonna explain to sort of summarize the meeting. I, we, we knew that Chicago was gonna make a presentation. What was the purpose of the meeting? Um, so the the meeting we just to put context on that um, that the email that you sent out um, just kind of notifying of the Chicago meeting from August or excuse me September thirteenth you'd indicated in that email that you would provide a summary of the meeting with the mayor's office so I think that's what they're yeah we're looking for oh, oh yes um, so we um, met with uh, staff from Chicago as well as the mayor in attendance from Joliet was myself. Um, interim city manager Steve Jones, as well as Mayor Odakirk. Um, a lot of the information um, that was discussed at that meeting will be presented in the presentation that um, representatives from Chicago will be making today. Um, it was generally discussed um, the city's um, desire to be more open and collaborative with partners, as well as um, rate study that they are performing to help um, you know, provide a defensible rate that is um, one that can be um, more uh, consistently applied to their regional, regional partners. So um, we, were, we met for approximately 45 minutes and I think in general it was a positive meeting. Um, I know Mayor Odekirk is here if you wanna speak at all on the meeting. Yeah. Um, if you have any questions, we had a similar meeting with the city of Hammond a couple months ago. So I think um, Mayor Lightfoot really made a presentation, really um, wanted to emphasize there's a, a change in, uh, I think the meaner coming from the city of Chicago towards its partners, and it was more of an outreach, I think, on their part. But they had the presentation, probably the same presentation we saw you're going to see tonight. Okay. Well, the meeting with Hammond was what? That was, uh, well, was, I guess, that was more from like 10,000 feet, that meeting, but again, Hammond expressed interest in partnering with Joliet and basically was give us an overview of what the city Hammond could provide or what they could bring to the table. So again, I think these different entities are trying to sell themselves to the city of Joliet. Okay. 
Okay, good. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate it. Um, as a, and maybe this is a better question left for when they give their presentation, but I did have one question. Um, was it discussed regarding the length of contracts that they are currently allowing? Because my understanding was that they were uh, truncating down the length of those contracts considerably. Um, was yeah, that, that, that specific dive into that at detail, all? I mean, I said we did not go into that level of detail. It was very um, high level, um, just talking about general approach. But um, you are more than welcome to ask that question, um, you know, of the of the city. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Excellent. Uh, one other question. You mentioned a uh, conference call with Indiana DNR. Mm -hmm. Did anything import happen in that call or what was that all about? Yes, so uh, again, we were um, wanting to do our due diligence to make sure that we understood the requirements um, necessary for a new intake um, in Indiana. And so it was a good conversation, um, you know, trying to understand who the permitting agency uh, would be. So there is definitely going to be some follow up with the um, IEPA to uh, Illinois Environmental Protection Agency to make sure that everyone understands, uh, so we understand um, you know, who we would need to go to and that there wouldn't be any issues with permitting. And the general feeling we got is that there would not be issues with, with permitting. Good, thank you. Yes. I have a question about Indiana. I thought it was more directed to Joe. Should I save it for old business or should I ask it now? Well, since, since you're we're waiting with bated breath for the question, go ahead. <laughs> He's got mints for your breath. There. And I've got mints for you. <laughs> uh, we've heard uh, at least three <clears throat> presentations on the compact, okay? And it's settled law. So my question is the following. Is it settled law if one state in the compact, the municipality, Joliet, goes through another state boundary lines into Lake Michigan, is the allocation towards the Illinois portion or does it count towards the Indiana portion since the intake is in Indiana? No, so the, the, the governing regulations in the compact, uh, Illinois has an allocation program. Since Joliet is a water user in Illinois, it would be required to obtain an allocation permit from the Illinois Department of Natural Resources under the Illinois program. That would grant it a permit to withdraw water, use water from Lake Michigan as a source of supply. Um, and that would be run through the Illinois DNR. The compact has a specific clause in it that excludes communities that are governed under the Illinois program from the requirements of the Great Lakes Compact. So it's, it's very clear that if a community has a, have an allocation permit in, in Illinois that's, that's granted, uh, that they are exempt from the requirements of the Great Lakes Compact that would apply to other diversion programs. Okay, uh, part two since a pipeline would cross state lines, would there be an interstate tax on water drawn for Joliet from the intake in Indiana across the state lines, shall we say similar to natural gas, similar to other utilities coming from other states? So based on, so we've had a series of discussions with the Illinois DNR, the Indiana Department of Environmental Management, which is kind of the counterpart to the Illinois EPA and the Illinois EPA. And there's never been any mention of, of any cost associated with that. The, the question we've been trying to clarify is really related to the permit. <coughs> so we, we clarify the rules regarding the allocation of the Great Lakes Compact from the Indiana DNR well as the Illinois DNR. And in discussions with IEPA and IDEM have focused on who would permit the new water supply. 
in general, the understanding right now is that because of the treatment plant, the water would be treated in, in, in Illinois and used to serve customers in Illinois, that Illinois EPA would permit the treatment plant and water supply as they normally would any other water supply in Illinois. Um, the question has been, what about the facilities in Indiana? And this was part of the discussion, the call that we just had with IDEM, and they have, they have suggested they're gonna have some discussions between IDEM and Illinois EPA to make sure that there's clarity so that when we go in to apply for our permits, there's no question as to if that were the option we're going forward with, who would be reviewing those permits and issuing them. So the recommendation is the treatment plant would be in the state of Illinois. That's, that's, been, that's what you're looking that we've at. Developed so far, yes. Okay, okay. And then just um, one suggestion, because you know what I'm hearing from Springfield, and you know they look for new ways to tax us. Um, I've heard that that topic has been bannered about in committee. You know, taxing water, interstate commerce. Just pass it along to you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. We always enjoy seeing you. Thank you. Um, the um, is there a method to the madness regarding uh, the education top topic thirteen being in front of the presentation by the city of Chicago? That's just general order. We typically don't present on the education topic. We just inquire if there are any qu questions. Well, I was thinking about putting the city of Chicago in front, just because they have to go back to Chicago. So moved. Okay. So if, if, there, if nobody has an objection, we can get them in and out so they can get on to their next location. I object that it's even on there. Right. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, so why don't we uh, go out of order and we'll uh, move straight into presentation of City of Chicago and then we'll come back to the education topic 13. Nobody have a problem with that? Okay. No. I'll, I'll turn the podium then over to Deputy Mayor Ann Sheehan and her team in Chicago to give their presentation. Okay. Thank you. Evening. Thank you for having us. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mayor Odekirk, uh, the Commission, uh, as well as Allison Twisher and Steve Jones, as well as any other residents and stakeholders that are here. Uh, and first, before we begin, I'd like to introduce our team. Um, so, if I could, uh, Commissioner Randy Connor uh, of the uh, Department of Water Management. Uh, we also have Andrea Poots, who handles, she's our Deputy Commissioner over uh, water quality. We have uh, Bulent Agar, who uh, handled, he's our Deputy Commissioner over Engineering. Uh, Jenny Bennett, who's our, the city's CFO, uh, as well as Jack Rosin, who's on our finance team. So thank you again for having us. Uh, before we begin uh, in depth into our presentation, I just wanted to take a minute and capitalize on some of the, the points uh, that Allison and the mayor brought up as to why we're here today. I don't think it's a secret to any of you. Uh, when the mayor uh, took office, we had a lot of feedback from our regional partners that Chicago needed to do better, needed to be a better water provider partner. We needed to bring people to the table. We need to do a better job of thinking about our partners and um, not presenting our water service as a take it or leave it kind of service, but really bringing people to the table to collaborate. And we're hoping that you'll find through our presentation here today that is exactly what we're here to do. The mayor has uh, <coughs> really, it's been a shift in values from the previous administration. Our mayor believes that water is a basic human right. And so we're really looking as sources dry up around the state, uh, we're really looking, and, and the region frankly, to see how we can be better partners at the table. And so I, I hope that you'll see that our presentation and our partnership moving forward is going to be one that's based on transparency, good governance, collaboration with our regional partners who frankly share a lot of the same challenges and opportunities that the city of Chicago does. Um, we've been working on this presentation and this is really gonna be a shift in culture as I think you'll, you've already maybe seen from our, uh, our proposal that this is not something that the city of Chicago has historically done in terms of providing multiple options uh, and, and providing a playing field that we can work with our partners to develop the best uh, service and delivery of service that's best for that municipality. Uh, and so this is really an invitation to Joliet to get in at the ground floor of what is going to be a major change in the way we deliver water to our region. 
And so with that, I'd like to hand it off to uh, Commissioner Randy Connor, who's going to kick off our presentation. So thank you again for letting us be here. Good evening. Again, my name is Randy Connor, Commissioner for Chicago Department of Water Management. And as we were putting this presentation together, I was taking a look at the logo for Joliet Water, and I noticed that there's a written word there, uh, rethink. And what that does is it kind of, it, it truly lines up with the, one of the missions of the Chicago Department of Water Management since I've been there, as well as uh, the, the mission of uh, the mayor's office. And so as we rethink how we look at water, not only in the city of Chicago, but with, you know, and as well as in the state, and as well as in the region. And as you know, we supply water to a lot of different people, but it's a matter of understanding what our customers' needs are and bringing everyone to the table so that everyone benefits from uh, Lake Michigan. So what, uh, what's nice about, there we go. So the question is, why Chicago's water? And as you can see, we have four statements there. High quality water, reliable sourcing of water, transparent and competitive, competitive pricing, and collaboration and openness. These four statements and beliefs are at the core of what the Department of Water Management uh, believe in and part of our mission statement, as well as, as I said, the city of Chicago with, uh, with the new administration and Mayor Lightfoot. As you know, the Chicago water system was born out of a need. And as, we, as, as you know, the, there was a lot of sewage and different things that were being dumped into Lake Michigan at the time, and, and then just different uh, ways of people being, getting sick. So what's interesting about this is that because it was born out of a need, it was decided that there would be a crib put out two miles out from uh, the shoreline to, be able to make it as a, as a water intake. And because of that, we um, have always tasked ourselves at talking to people and collaborating with people and, and just asking the question, what are the best ways for us to treat, pump, and, and, and purify, and, and uh, filter water? And we've, been, we've partnered with different states, we've partnered with different cities, we've partnered with different countries, and in different cities and other countries, just to understand exactly what that looks like. And what we found out is that uh, we consider ourselves a leader in the water industry because of the innovations that we've had, but we do not consider ourselves the leader because we also understand that to be a leader, you have to also be a follower, which means that there has to be some type of collaboration with other people to understand the need and to try to move things forward. And with that being said, uh, because of that, Chicago has a proven track record of successfully providing regional residents with safe, reliable water. And, it, and we've also made, because of our collaborations and our efforts, We've made $1 billion in investments to the system over the last 10 years. And Chicago has never had to shut down the water supply due to poor quality or environmental issues. We also have an extensive quality assurance uh, program as, and, as well as quality control to ensure uh, EPA compliance. And we are aggressively working, uh, to, uh, progressively working to protect Lake Michigan, Lake Michigan from repeat clean, act, uh, clean Water Act violators. So the question is, how does that benefit the city of um, of, of Joliet. It's, it provides a resilient, dependable source of water, as well as a 21st century water system to support a 21st century quality of life. It, 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 beside, it, it also provides a reliable source of, of, of a water supply. And with that, no regulatory worries regarding the source of water, as well as a safe water source for generations to come. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Andrea Poots, who will actually give you a, 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 some background on the actual water supply. Um, so Chicago, we're experts in water quality. Um, we have got analysis and sampling and monitoring down. <coughs> uh, we have unparalleled expertise in water analysis. All of our samples coming from the Sawyer plant, which can serve Joliet, are driven daily to the Jardine plant, where we have two state-certified labs. We have our microbiology lab, which is state-certified by the Illinois Department of Public Health. We also have our chemistry lab, which is certified by the EPA, to National Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program standards, NELAP standards. Um, many of our staff have over 20 years of experience. We have six of our staff with advanced degrees, just in those two labs alone. Um, we analyze over 60 different parameters. That's well above the minimum. So we do a lot of stuff voluntarily to be proactive. And then we don't stop there. We put it on our website. If you can Google it, we have tons of water quality reports up there, very comprehensive. 
We also do about 20,000 individual tests every month, 20,000. So we, we are experts in analysis. But we don't stop there. We have robust water distribution system monitoring. We have our water quality surveillance section, which is filled with engineers that go out into the field, they sample, they're troubleshooting. They are experts in corrosion control and system analysis. Um, 11 of them are college degree engineers. Five of those have advanced engineering degrees. Four of them are state certified water operators. And amongst them, we have decades of corrosion control experience. And as we all know, water chemistry can be very complicated. Um, you know, we see what happened in Flint, and we're very cautious to make sure that any changes we make to the water chemistry, the water quality, are researched ahead of time and thoroughly thought out. And of course, we're always there to uh, help provide any technical support to our customers. Um, my cell phone is attached to my hip, so our, our wholesale customers, feel free to give me a call and if they have any technical issues or questions that they want answered. A quick question, did you say um, the treatment would be occurring in Sawyer, that's Michigan, is that, is that right? Or? Oh, no, uh, it's the Eugene Sawyer Water Purification Plant. Okay. Which perfectly timed right here on the next slide. Excuse me, I, I grew up in Michigan, so I, oh, I, was, yes. I was just trying to clarify that. Okay. Yes, yes. So um, the Eugene Sawyer plant, so we, we commonly call it Sawyer plant, um, would be the one that would serve Joliet on our south side. And it opened in 1947 and has a capacity of over 720 million gallons a day. Um, we have, Sawyer so plant alone has received $100 million in upgrades over the last five years. Um, which is significant. Uh, those upgrades have improved operations, um, improved water filtration quality, increased treatment efficiency, and reliably benefited the entire region. Um, of those 720 million gallons a day capacity, we use about 300 million gallons a day. We also have a project underway um, that, would, that is likely to increase the capacity from 720 to about 900 million gallons a day, which allows capacity to serve Georgia. This treatment plant uh, is staffed with about 120 seasoned engineers and operators. Um, of 12 of them are college degree civil, chemical, and mechanical engineers, and they work around the clock. Uh, these staff have up to 37 years of experience, and they've kind of seen it all. <laughs> um, they're also available to respond to issues and provide technical support to Joliet as needed. And eight of these engineers have their class A water operators. Not one, not one water operator for the plant, eight. In addition uh, to the state certified labs that are at Jardine, we have what we call our control laboratory that's located at Sawyer. Uh, so it has its own lab that's run 24 seven. Um, there we have six college degree chemists that perform over 30,000 individual tests a month. And those tests help us monitor our, our source water quality, they help us monitor the treatment process, and optimize to make sure we're meeting all of the regulations. Also at Sawyer, we have a pipe loop uh, set up. We're doing research uh, into corrosion control. So we have state-of-the-art innovations going on, uh, trying to decide if we're optimized with regard to corrosion control, if there's something we can be doing better in terms of the treatment process. We also have both uh, crib and shore intakes at Sawyer, which allow for some redundancy. Um, and of course, our intake tunnel from the crib is uh, all the way into bedrock. So it's not just a pipe near the lake bed. It goes down into bedrock, back over to shore, and up into the treatment plant. So it's very reliable. And we have extensive security personnel and resources protecting our water supply. So, you know, water supply, it's much easier to keep your water supply clean than it is to treat dirty water. We like to protect our water supply, Lake Michigan. Um, you know, if you may have seen in the news recently, there's a lot of threats to Lake Michigan water quality in Indiana, so we like to be proactive. We have a boat that actually goes out and samples, um, make sure that what's coming in is clean. And, you know, doing that means that we have safe water, not just for Chicago, but for Joliet and the region. Um, and to talk more about that, uh, So again, uh, why Chicago's water? So, one thing that we believe in is, is the transparency and competitive pricing. Um, it's, it's refreshing to know that when uh, Mayor Lifer came in that she was all about transparency. 
Um, as I went to the Department of Water Management to take over this initiative, it was one of the things that I believed in was transparency, that there should be no hit, nothing hidden, and that we should talk about everything and ensure that everything's on the table so we can make the, the correct decision. So with that, you know, Chicago's committed to be a transparent and fair and be transparent and fair uh, region-wide, especially with our water strategy and developing relationships based on trust. With, the, with that trust, there has to be some sort of communication or back and forth uh, between, between people to make sure that people are on the same page. And with that, because of that communication, Chicago's working on a region-wide water rate study that will be completed by the end of 2019. This will give us an opportunity to offer the best rates in not only in the city of Chicago, but to all of our customers. Uh, we supply water to 125 suburbs, 51 direct connects, and we're looking to expand that. But by only the way we can do that is to have a constant line of communication so that everyone understands that we can come to an agreement on what that rate should be. And we also, with that, we seek to, um, to engage with Joliet to, to collaborate on that transparency and, and, and within that rate structure. Um, again, it's about communication. I mean, we're excited about uh, the, the, the communication part of this. We're excited about engaging everyone. We're just excited about the opportunity to be able to provide water to the great city of Joliet. And with that, we want to, always, again, always make sure that we have an open dialogue with Joliet to find the best solution for both cities. It's not about Chicago having the best deal. It's not about the city of Joliet having the best deal. It's about what's going to make the region better. It's about what's going to be able to provide and keep providing the highest quality of water to the entire region. And we're willing to pay um, an upfront costs for capital improvements or support uh, Joliet as, if they want to take the lead. Again, it's about a partnership, it's about collaboration, it's about ensuring that our water system is safe, it's about ensuring that our source water is safe, but it's also ensuring that the people who are receiving water, who are receiving the water, are getting high quality water and that they know that they have the right to water and we have to work with them to ensure that they know that. Um, and again, we're willing to work toward um, a collaborative solution, whatever that solution is. And again, we're excited about it, we're extremely excited about it, and we want to make sure that everyone knows that. And we'll have Bulan Agar, who's the Deputy Commissioner of Engineering, come up now and talk about what those concepts will look like in collaboration. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, so, um, so I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about some of the options that are on the table that we're looking at right now, and also some of the uh, um, concepts, some of the alternatives that are that our uh, <coughs> design consulting engineers are working on. Uh, um, so option one would be to go on to the, the two different options. Option one would be to, uh, for Chicago to provide the water to our city limits, which would be at Southwest uh, Pumping Station at 84 from Kentwell. And uh, having Joliet assuming responsibility for design, construction, um, design, planning, construction, commissioning, ownership, and operation of, of all the new infrastructure. Now the second option would be uh, for Chicago to supply the water to uh, Joliet's water supply point of, uh, at Fairmont and Garvin Street, Joliet, and also Chicago assuming responsibility for design, construction, commissioning, operation, and all of uh, and ownership and operation of all the new infrastructure. Uh, go to the next slide. So this is one of the concept diagrams uh, that we've been looking at. Our design consultants have been looking at. So again, this is going to be a pipeline that's going to be upwards of 20 miles. And uh, it's going to be crossing different municipalities. Uh, it's going to be crossing expressways, uh, railroads, uh, rivers. So um, as the design is uh, being finalized and as the discussions are taking place for the amount of water that's going to be provided, uh, there's going to be some refinements to this design. But uh, just to go through uh, some of the basics of it, um, to the right of the slide, to the right of the page, you will see 16th Street the slash uh, Dunn Creek taking the water in. Uh, that's that's, that crew is about two miles out from the uh, shore, uh, so it's clean water. And also, that's taking the water at 30 feet below uh, lake level. It's not surface water that's, that we're taking in. And we're going to be, uh, so we do use our tunnels that are 14 to 16 feet in diameter to get that water from the crib to the Sawyer purification plant. And once that purification process is completed uh, in our uh, tunnel, we get it to the Southwest Pumping Station. Now, that's the existing conditions today. Um, Based on the preliminary calculations, uh, a new tunnel extension to get uh, this water to our new pumping station, the booster station with uh, a reservoir would have to be constructed to be able to supply this water to Joliet. And again, like I was saying, when we are finalizing the conversations, 
the amount of water that needs to be pumped and the lengths and the final route uh, being uh, finalized, uh, these uh, numbers will be looked at again and certified. Um, Could you just back up just before you turn the page? You said it would require a reservoir? Correct. I mean, that's, those are the preliminary uh, plans that we're looking at. Our design. Could you describe the reservoir? Is it? Uh, it uh, there's uh, different designs for it. It could be a hole in the ground, but I mean, it's, it's dependent on the uh, air that we have in the area. So it could be basically a reservoir that's open, or it could be a storage uh, area underground where uh, you'd have to find a real estate for that, obviously. But just to be able to get the water ready for you guys. Uh, for, for sure. Uh, I just right. remember at one of our joint meetings, someone saying a reservoir would never be needed. But what are you calling um, capacity? What would a, a, a reservoir like this require? Can you ballpark it? I wouldn't be able to ballpark it right now. We'll have to go back to concept drawings and the diagrams. I mean, but, would um, it be like one day's usage? Uh, so Is there a formula? We're, we're looking at uh, the prop minimum that would be required would most likely be uh, two days of uh, maximum. Uh, but I mean, again, this is going to be a longer pipe than uh, right. as the uh, other municipalities have. So it'd be prudent to have a larger. Uh, Makes sense. Storage. Sure. Right. Thank you. My name is Jenny Bennett. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for the City of Chicago. Um, I wanted to thank you for having us here this evening and um, give you a little bit of background on myself. Um, before I was Chief Financial Officer for the City, I was Chief Financial Officer for the Chicago Public Schools. And before that, I was an investment banker at a major Wall Street firm where worked, I worked on a number of transactions, including a fairly large water and wastewater acquisition financing for the city of Indianapolis. Um, we wanted to thank you for having us here today because we know that this is a very important decision for the city of Juliet. Um, and as evidenced by that, I can see that a lot of work has already been done and will continue to be done as it relates to um, where it is that you decide to take your water. Um, as a part of that, uh, we know that um, the, uh, many of the people that you're talking to here are new to these discussions and that you've had some of these discussions for a long period now, um, and in particular myself and Anne, um, who um, are part of the mayor's administration, we've been in office now for four months and um, are starting to engage in a number of conversations with our regional partners. Um, as a part of that, what we've learned is uh, to reiterate what Ann had said earlier is that the historical um, conversation um, hadn't been as fulsome as it should have been. And ultimately that um, in order to uh, talk about how it is that water supply is being um, distributed um, throughout the region, as Ann mentioned, the mayor is very committed to the value that water is a basic human right. It's not a commodity, it's not an asset that we try to sell, but it's, um, it's a resource that we all share and that we are looking for a more efficient way to be able to do that more broadly. Um, and so I can say that to you today, and I know that um, trust takes time, and ultimately we wanna be able to engage with you over time um, as you go through this process to demonstrate the commitment that we have to that value. Um, but having worked with the mayor um, over the last four months, but also engaging with her in a number of conversations, whether it's water, whether it's um, um, other issues that are affecting a number of, um, of uh, municipalities regionally, I know that she is very committed to the uh, concept of we are better together in all of this and building that broader partnership. Um, we've already started having uh, some conversations, not, again, not just related to water, um, but to a number of issues more broadly um, in, in that, address, that affect all of us um, in order to be able to build those partnerships that help us to become a better state overall. Um, and so with that, I did want to spend a little bit of time on our thoughts um, and philosophy behind the rate structure and the pricing proposal that we've provided to you. Uh, the, um, the rate structure ultimately is not just about price, and we know that. Um, it's about making sure that uh, Joliet and um, all of the other 
um, community partners in the area um, that you decide to partner with um, feel certain that there is a um, predictable rate schedule going forward, that there's certainty as it relates to what potential liabilities might be, and importantly, that you have a voice at the table in how it is that that rate structure is determined and that we're all working on it together. It's not just the city of Chicago determining your rates, but that we are all engaged in um, how it is that we're uh, creating some transparency around, around rates. Um, as a result of that, our goal here, as stated on this page, is to create a transparent, predictive rate model while fostering trusting relationships with Chicago's regional partners. Again, I know trust takes time, and that's something that we hope to demonstrate to you over the, over the uh, short term, um, but it is something that we are um, engaged in um, currently in trying to develop what that um, future rate planning could look like. Some of the outcomes that we hope to see from that is a long-term sustainable regional water supply. Um, obviously, Lake Michigan um, has a significant water supply, uh, and it looks like, uh, you know, based on some of the reports um, that we've seen so far, that you've been taking a look at alternative sources, um, but that there is uh, a significant amount of water that um, would be available for Joliet and its regional um, partners over the long term. Second outcome would be predictable and uh, predictive rates. I mentioned earlier about how um, you know, we are committed to taking a look at a way um, for us to be able to provide some more certainty around that rate structure going forward. It's not just something we've heard from the regional partners that the city of Chicago serves, but also from our own customers um, and residents who pay rates that um, significant increases over a short period of time doesn't help with how it is that those costs get absorbed over time. Um, so creating better planning around how it is that we're making infrastructure improvements and how that fits within the rate model um, that, gets, uh, that goes to calculating those costs going forward. Um, and then finally, a regional water supply that fosters economic growth for the region. So we know that water um, is not just about drinking water, but also about how it is that you can supply um, future economic growth and is part of a basic infrastructure that, whether it's transportation or water or other services that a municipality provides, um, is part of a resource that helps to foster economic growth going forward. And to the extent that we can be more efficient as a region in a strategic plan around how we provide those services more broadly, share in some of the costs and investments, um, that's ultimately some of the work that we hope to do together with you and others. Um, on the next slide, we wanted to reiterate a couple of points um, about the city of Chicago, um, how um, water um, is incorporated within our finances, um, and also our overall um, work that we're doing in order to try to change some of the structure of that to help serve um, Joliet as well as some other regional partners. Um, first off, the Chicago water system operates as what's called an enterprise fund. Um, enterprise fund is a separate fund from the city of Chicago's corporate fund. And, um, as a, and as a result of that, we have um, two main enterprise funds. It's the um, uh, Chicago Water and Sewer Credit, as well as, the, um, as well as the airport credits. And within that, there are separate enterprise funds for water, for <coughs> sewer, as well as for um, Midway and O'Hare. Um, the enterprise fund concept is important because what that means is that we have to keep money separate from the main corporate fund in order to ensure um, a number of different uh, uh, regulations and uh, restrictions are met. Most importantly of which, if for whatever reason there's some commingling of funds, it would um, immediately warrant um, potential rating actions on the credit. Um, it's something that the rating agencies take very seriously and hence the reason why the accounting for those funds are separate. Um, in addition to that, I've also talked about the fact that we are committed to changing the perception around how it is that uh, Chicago has um, approached um, water supply more, more broadly in the region. Um, the commissioner spoke to the fact that we are rethinking how it is that we um, engage in that water supply, and it is a different model from what you may have heard in the past. And um, you know, what we ask for at this point really is just the time to be able to demonstrate that uh, commitment to rethinking how it is that we are supplying water. Um, additionally, um, we are, uh, as the first uh, down payment on that commitment, taking a look at a competitive rate study as well as an internal cost of service study. Um, and so the distinction there is not just as it relates to how our rates that we offer to you are competitive versus our, co our, our regional um, other competitors, because uh, again, it's not just about the ultimate price that you pay, um, but also um, how it is that we are um, allocating those costs internally 
creating more transparency around that um, and uh, sharing that information with others, and importantly, in co-developing um, the um, way that we calculate um, the, that internal uh, cost of service study um, uh, with, with you and with others. Um, we've had some conversations with other uh, regional water utilities and taken a look at how it is that they do those type of allocations. Um, you know, a lot more math goes into that than the way it is that Chicago does that now. And we've hired some uh, consultants to help us in developing what that might look like. Um, our goal is, is to have a first phase of that just so we can have some basic information around what it is that our system currently does, what the rates currently look like. And then um, starting in the first uh, quarter of 2020 to be able to start engaging um, some of our uh, regional partners in that discussion so that, again, we can co uh, collaborate on that going forward. Yes, yeah, I just have a question. So we're, um, you said there earlier, uh, someone had said that the rate study will be available, will be finished by the end of the year, but um, we're also going to be getting, uh, we were told, getting the money information on, on in November, and then we're making a decision in December. So I'm just concerned, is there uh, incomplete information there? Are we going to have that information? Should we put off the recommendation a month or so, or, or, or what, what do you think, I mean, Allison? The, uh, and um, Jenny will get to it. There has been um, dollars amounts uh, provided as kind of a upper um, range of that. So that's what the cost information to be presented uh, will be. I mean, we will not be making a decision with all the information at, you know, that we'll never have all the information. Um, you know, any of the options, there is going to move into a negotiation phase that would then provide that, you know, that information. But um, we feel that we're going to be providing the, the cost information with the best information that we have. And just to add to the uh, to that, the uh, we understand that you know that you are um, in phase two currently of this process, and um, this is a process that will take time. Um, there are 125 communities that we serve, and it's not just about Joliet, but it's really about engaging in a conversation with all of them, and that's a partnership that's going to take time to build. Um, in the meantime, um, because of that, though, you are engaging in a process now, which in December, um, you know, I understand that there's a decision um, as it relates to uh, a decision point that needs to be made. Uh, and uh, in that vein, as a part of the proposal and the RFI response, and again, because we have been here for four months, we knew that the RFI was there, we wanted to make sure that we were part of this process. Um, but by the same token, you know, also building uh, simultaneously what is hopefully an, uh, a, broader, a broader collaborative of, um, of efforts around water supply. Um, we did also provide a response, which is a little more concrete than what I just described related to that collaboration in that rate study. Um, and um, you know, hopefully we can dual track this as it relates to the contract that you ultimately enter into, um, which we can also talk about term and, uh, you know, and, and certainty around that uh, from a legal perspective. Um, but uh, you know, what we've heard from you and from others is it's not just about the contract, it's not just about the rate, but it's also about how it is we um, endeavor to engage in what ultimately is very much like a marriage um, over time. And so uh, you, know, it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit of uh, you know, dual tracking uh, these two efforts. Um, we want to make sure we meet your timelines and uh, you know the requests that you've made of information from people who are looking to provide you with water. Um, but at the same time, we, it's not like we're losing time either in trying to make this outreach um, to not just you, but um, other partners across um, the, the city and the uh, region. Could I just tap on to, oh, tap on to Commissioner Kaufman's question here? Uh, on page 13, of your handout here, it says base rate 398. You're saying that could change. Right, so what we're offering at this point is, and we can skip to that page, um, what we're offering at this point is a 398 base rate. Um, and then in addition to that, and, and that's based on what we currently do. So sure. currently the base rate for um, not just the city of Chicago, but everyone else is the 398. Um, uh, this is a departure from the past because it's um, not usual that we've, uh, you know, gone beyond the city border in order to help um, extend the pipeline um, to our regional customers uh, all that all that frequently, and uh, and also because this pipeline is a little bit longer than most pipelines would be. 
Um, in that vein and in the process of uh, developing the RFI response here, what we've done is um, a con a done an analysis of a rate study as it relates to, first off, um, the engineering and the construction costs of a pipeline, all of the various um, uh, uh, components that would need to be built in order to supply water from Chicago to Joliet. Um, that estimate, um, you know, we put into the RFI response was somewhere between 430 to 520 million dollars. Um, costed that out as it relates to um, what we thought that the uh, the uh, ongoing um, debt service costs of that would be. And then also importantly, um, the operating expenses that it would take to get water from Chicago um, to uh, Joliet um, and built a model around that. Um, and so in that vein, because of the 398 and the fact that it is the current cost structure and we have not yet conducted the rate study, we basically took the 398 and then added some of the um, various costs that were layered into that to get to what we think is an up to charge of the 575 and then um, provided two options for us to consider as we continue this discussion. Option one would be in essence really just starting from the Chicago um, uh, 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 border and then having uh, somebody else build the pipeline to us. Um, the 575 would be the other end of it and um, ultimately we would look to engage with you in a discussion about exactly how we get from point A to point B. At, at our July 31st joint meeting with the City Council, a, a gentleman at our table indicated to Councilman Gavin and I that it was the 398 mm -hmm. you know, price and just for discussion purposes, um, trying to project out five years. Um, I know we had a presentation by Jeff about adding a new well, mm -hmm. but just basing that on a, a 20 million gallon a day usage at $4 per 1,000, I, I believe it comes out to about $20 million a year, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and then do I hear correctly that any previous, like, Back in February, someone gave us a um, Chicago, City of Chicago contract for water. You're redoing the contract, it sounds like. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And actually, so as a part of this, um, we, um, we are going to be taking a look at a master agreement going forward um, and taking a look at what that might look like. Um, you know, don't know exactly the specifics. I, I know term was mentioned as a potential question in the RFI. Um, we've proposed somewhere between a 10 to 35 year term, ultimately subject to our conversations with you. Um, and, you know, frankly, a longer term actually is more beneficial in some ways because we're making and you're making both an, an, an a fairly significant initial investment. And so the longer the term, um, the more certainty you have as it relates to rates and um, the more certainty we have as it relates to the overall investment. So then my question would be for the chairman, if their RFI has been submitted and other RFIs have been submitted and we have it on the agenda and the commission voted on this, that we're going to discuss funding options and um, funding strategies, wouldn't having those RFIs be crucial to us to discuss funding strategies or funding options. I don't know what that presentation includes, so perhaps it already addresses that. We could ask. The, uh, the specific RFI information is going to be provided in the um, phase two study report, so that information will be presented. That'll be the basis for which we provide the information to you on, on November 13th. Did you know that? No. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just had a few other, oh, any other questions? Yes. Part of the difference between, a big part of the difference between option one and option two on that page, one, we build it, the other, you build it. Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? Yeah, and I would say, you know, mostly we want to talk about, um, you know, what your preferences are. Um, we've had some conversations. Uh, but obviously, we need to continue that conversation. Um, but in essence, that's those are the bookends. No, that's the. So who owns it? In either option, who owns it? Do we own it in in option one? So and if we're entirely uh, responsible for right operation, maintenance, and so forth. Right. So if we build it, we would own it. Um, if you build it 100%, you would own it. 
Um, if we build it part way, we'd have to determine how that would work. There's some engineering work, as I understand it, in terms of, uh, you know, you want to make sure there's a break as it relates to who, who owns what portion. Um, you know, there are right away issues as well as you get, you know, from Chicago to Joliet because of the distance, we'd have to consider that. Um, so that's subject to a conversation that we need to have, which I think, as you point out, it's not without its complications. Um, and also because of the length of the pipe is also without, not without its complications. Um, but we want to engage in that discussion. Um, it's possible, I know there are also other alternatives where a third party may um, build it and uh, own it and ultimately we lease it. That's you know, another conversation we could have. Um, but mostly what we wanted to do was really provide some bookends around this and then engage in that conversation with you. The bottom line on that though is that we are your only customer. There is no other customers that we can add. At this point, we're not, um, we're, we're, this pricing doesn't incorporate other customers. Um, but, you know, obviously, uh, you know, we want to talk about what that might mean going forward. Um, but this proposal would engage, would, would, is currently only contemplating um, Juliet. I think the question that has to be asked is, would Juliet be allowed to take this water, pay you for this water, and sell it, sell to, it to someone others, else. Right. That, that's the qu yeah. and that's unanswered at this point in time. Yeah. Correct. And I think we should talk about that. I, you know, at this point, because of, you know, what it what it takes to build a pipeline, we can tell you what the cost of that might be. We can do a math model about it. Um, but as it relates to who else might join up to the pipeline, who you might sell water to, how that might work, how the pipe, who would own those pipelines that come off of the main pipeline. Um, that's a conversation that we should we would want to have going forward. I don't think uh, you know it's uh, it's as easy as you know really just saying okay thirty to sixty and let's do some math around that. Um, we would really want to just talk about what 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 that would. Of course, look like. it's complicated. What is that? Of course, it's complicated. Yeah, <laughs> I will just clarify that they did respond to both the thirty MGD, which is the Joliet only option, and the sixty MGD regional option. So I mean, both of those options are presented. You know, so I don't th believe that there would you would preclude other communities from um, obtaining water in a regional um, right. approach. Right. And it's I should not, just, it's, not, it's yeah. not obtaining the water. The question is, can Joliet sell the water they buy from you, much like DuPage Water Commission? Right. So I think that's a great clarification, because my, my, my comment was really meant to say that um, we're not reliant upon the additional sales as it relates to the price that we're offering here, but it's not that Joliet's precluded. Mm -hmm. So okay. just to be clear. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, sure. And then, you know, I know we skipped a couple pages. Uh, you know, just another comment. We have started to reach out to other um, partners. Um, you know, we've had some conversations with Oak Lawn, which is the second largest uh, uh, customer with the system, and some of the other uh, regional partners. We haven't met with all of them yet, um, in part because just ba based on time, but we do anticipate doing that in the near term. Um, if we go to page 11 really quickly. Um, this is uh, a little bit of what we have uh, contemplated and in store for uh, the regional study, uh, taking a look at um, a wholesale uh, customer outreach program. So not just um, you know about doing math as it relates to what the rates look like and how, uh, how it's been invested within the system, but also um, how it is that we reach out and start building relationships, um, drafting a rate and planning model going forward, uh, and the formulation of a wholesale customer um, advisory group, as well as development of a st overall strategic plan. Again, these are more long-term in nature, but are um, currently contemplated as a part of uh, the work that, we, that we've already kicked off. Um, and then, uh, by way of the uh, competitive rate study, just to reiterate, we do um, expect to have phase one of that completed by December of 2019, um, and would include not just the competitive rate study, but an internal cost of service study, um, and then, importantly, engaging others in, um, in uh, the discussion around how that's developed going forward. So that concludes our presentation. Um, I, uh, again, want to... Th oh, yes. Please. Sorry, Jenny. I have a question. Can you elaborate a little bit more about the Wholesale Customer Advisory Group? Sure. Your thoughts on that? So um, what we have learned is it relates to some of the best practices that are, that are practices that are done elsewhere. Um, is that it's not just uh, you know create um, an allocation of costs and 
uh, electrical pumpage and, and, and electricity costs and pumpage and, and distance, et cetera, um, but that it's important to engage in a dialogue around what's fair and making sure that everyone has a seat at the table and determining that. And so the idea around the advisory group is to create a group um, uh, who would be interested in um, talking about what that means. Um, we've also had some conversations with um, regional organizations that already do some of this work and already have established uh, some of those lines of communication to help um, uh, you know, coordinate that, uh, that, that advisory group. Um, we are at the very beginning stages of formulating what that might look like, and ultimately when we do look to start to create a, an advisory group, we would want to make sure that we're co-creating it. It's not just, okay, Chicago is going to create an advisory group, but that we would do that in conjunction with others. Um, but that's some of the initial concepts around what that might look like. May we ask questions of other people from Chicago? Sure, is, absolutely. Is that possible? Absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Uh, Andrea? Um, first to the whole Chicago contingent, um, I would like to compliment Mayor Lightfoot. At the end of August, uh, she issued uh, $19 million uh, for the homeowners and businesses that were affected by the water meter change out and the increased lead. So when I read that, and I hear what you're saying about Mayor Lightfoot, it seems like she's walking the talk. Are you afraid the, the water filters that were- Right, the $19 yes. million dollars that she yeah. just allocated for that. Um, number two, um, you process one billion gallons of Lake Michigan water a day, okay? Uh, you serve 125 communities. A lot of your presentation, you know, we're still gonna wait to get facts and figures. <laughs> How do you do it? How do you do it so good? We have lots of talented staff. Lots okay. of talented staff. In looking, in looking at your website, okay, and looking at other websites, tell me if I'm wrong here, and please tell me if I'm wrong. It looks like when you take in Lake Michigan water, the first thing you do is you strain it. And the point that you make about the cribs, or that gentleman made about the cribs being so far out, uh, is so important because we don't inherit what our friends from Milwaukee put in the water. The cribs are further out, okay? Um, you strain the water, and then it appears that you add a flocculant to get it to precipitate out, okay? And, and you settle it out, okay? Then you add your disinfectant, okay? And then you run it over some charcoal or you run sand it? Sand filters, yes. Sand filters. And is that it? Uh, that's the gist of it. We call it conventional treatment. Sure. Um, it, it sounds simple, but it works really right. well. Um, we also add corrosion control at the end of that sure. treatment process as well, which is pretty critical, and fluoride as well, state mandated sure. um, fluoride levels. But um, obviously the most important components are your alum, which is the flocculant you refer right. to, and your chlorine. Okay. You don't have to do anything exotic. Okay. Correct. You don't have to use resins, you don't have to use ultraviolet lights, you don't have to, exotic, Let, let's yeah, just say that. we don't that. do membrane filtration, we don't need to do desalination, we don't need to do uh, a, a lot of complicated things because the source water that we have is, is fairly clean, or very large. And, and let me just say there's a few gentlemen in the room here and myself to go back to the days where there was never a handle on the water fountains along Lake Michigan. The water just ran, there was no off, it just ran. So basically you use a, a pretty natural um, method, a pretty standard conventional method. Okay, cool. That's all I had to ask. Any further questions for the city? Okay, whichever order you want. Just a quick question. Uh, Joseph Roth, 1419 West Acres Road, Joliet, Illinois. Uh, I have a question on, on the rate. First, um, does the rate proposals incre uh, incorporate a, uh, a function for uh, creating a maintenance CIP fund 
over, over time. So 10 years out, you have a projected replacement of a pipe. The money is there to replace it, as opposed to a lot of public projects where so. there is a rate increase down the line because, oh, we need 50 million to do X, <coughs> but we haven't been setting up to accomplish X. And I think that's what's the DuPage Water Commission, that's one thing they have done. So that's simple. How do you, is there that function in the rates to gradually account for projectile costs 10 years or more down the line and be ready to implement, you know, as you go? And then the other question is, I compliment Mayor Lightfoot. Uh, I grew up in Chicago in the old days. I know, but the good intentions and policies that are discussed, a question would be how those get codified into enduring policies that Joliet and others can depend on uh, beyond her term of office. Sure, thank you for that uh, comment. Um, so, uh, uh, and questions. Um, as it relates to the codification, um, I'm not sure how I should, uh, should I turn around or, <laughs> as it relates to the, okay. As it relates to the codification of the uh, rate structure, um, we are offering um, at this point uh, the rate structure within the context of the contract and obviously the longer term uh, you know, planning that we have around the transparency, et cetera, um, is a work in progress, but we would hope to be able to codify that going forward. Um, but at the very least, as it relates to the term, um, we are offering a fairly long term on the contract and, um, and, and the hope is to be able to provide some predictability as it relates to rates going forward. Um, by way of the capital maintenance, um, we have incorporated into the rate structure ongoing maintenance, um, assuming that it is that we own um, the pipeline all the way through in that rate structure. Um, if there are major repairs, uh, you know, something happens where the entire line is, you know, needs replacing or something like that, obviously we have to talk about what that looks like, but at this point it currently does incorporate ongoing maintenance and repair into the costs. Gross. Bruce Brown with 1508 West Acre Road. My question is more to the engineering director. And my question is this, with a pipeline that long and with a storage reservoir that contains a two plus days worth of water supply, <coughs> is there anything that needs to be done at the Joliet end when the water arrives to polish it to make it, you know, is there, are there problems with that? Thank you. Good question. So, um, you know, water quality obviously is a concern and you want to make sure that um, you have nice fresh water, um, but it, it depends a lot on how much you're using. So that it all comes down to residence time. You know, if you're, if you're uh, drawing a lot, you're going to have fresh water um, and, and, you know, we have pretty great chlorine levels um, going out to our suburbs. Um, we're actually in the process of increasing our chlorine um, as well, but uh, it really does come down to how much water is going to be pulled out of that. I, I have one more question. I just I noticed in the packet here the projections like 2030, and then I seen another one for 2025. That was the first time I've seen something with such a short projection of build time. If the engineer may talk a little bit about that. Was it saying it's available as early as 2025? Yeah. Right. Did I miss that? You know, I believe it's the um, the t time frame. You know, as far as the schedules, and that's something that we'll incorporate into the information that we're going to present in November. Because okay. definitely, so each alternative has a different um, time frame. You know, with with Chicago, you don't have to build a water treatment plant and get a new intake, and that requires more time. So there are going to be differences in the time frame that it takes to implement the alternatives, and we'll provide that information as part of the phase two study. But for the Chicago option, it would potentially be a 2025? Uh, yeah, potentially, um, as they've stated, when you're building the transmission main alone, you know that could be a much shorter time frame to, okay. to do that. OK, thank you. And just one last question. I'm sure you're aware that, you know, we kind of inherited a 28% water loss in our piping system. Okay. Um, I know nationwide, you know, they're talking about a trillion dollars of, you know, repairs being needed. And we know that uh, 
I believe Joe has indicated IDPR, the allocation. We have to work at getting that down. Otherwise, we're paying Chicago for water and we're losing water. I mean, it's that simple. Okay. Do you have any uh, parameters we should be aware of concerning water losses? So uh, in Chicago, we also have metered houses and non-metered houses. So it's hard to kind of quantify how much of that is loss versus unaccounted for. So I mean, you got uh, fire hydrants, you got uses uh, oh, sure. from residences that are in the uh, meters. <clears throat> so it's <clears throat> I apologize. If I'm even cold. Uh, it's hard to quantify the loss by itself. But no, I, I, I don't mean that. I mean the Chicago have a rule that we won't oh. sell water to somebody if you have unless you drop your unless you drop it, I, you have anything similar that's all i'm asking uh, I don't think we do. nothing it's in your contracts like, it's going to be just like joe mentioned it's going to be the idnr and the allocation so okay the state might dictate something to joe yet but i don't think we do. just double checking thank you I, I just have a question i don't know who ex exactly would answer this but um a big component of this decision I see is basically ownership and risk um, and so I'm just curious um, it sounds like you have a you know well-oiled machine there is how big is your legal team and how often do you have to deal with uh, whether reasonable or frivolous but like how, how what kind of lawsuits do you deal with with such a with a you know uh, such a large amount of water and, and distributing that sure thanks uh, so we have uh, an attorney with uh, the Department of Water Management, but then we also have a uh, Department of Law who works very closely with the Department of Water Management, uh, and we have a group that's dedicated to the environment and water issues, and so uh, we have a pretty robust team that is working to ensure that um, not only uh, are we making sure that we're legally adhering to all the EPA standards, that our practices are sound and based in, in, um, in legalities in Illinois, uh, and, and Chicago, and then also uh, a really robust team that works on the environment as it pertains to Lake Michigan, um, you know, going after people for Clean Water Act uh, violations, et cetera. And so that's something that, um, you know, when it comes from the lake to the infrastructure to the treatment itself, um, we have a pretty robust team. And, and the water department and the mayor's office meet every week to talk about our, uh, our ongoing operations, as well as outreach uh, and um, no partnership to all of our municipalities. So. So, so, so I guess, you know, what I'm, and, and I appreciate that, it's just, um, I'm trying to get a sense as best as I can of this option of, because essentially the, this option places some, it, it places the risk towards you, whereas we're looking right. at others that don't. Um, and so I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of, I mean, is this the place where there's a lot of frivolous lawsuits or is it that people don't really come to utilities for that? Or it's how, how busy is your legal team and, and, and how, and it's just uh, trying, trying to get a sense so of. So I don't, I don't know that we have that many uh, lawsuits as it pertains to our infrastructure and our, um, uh, our water, um, uh, providing water to any partners or even within the city. Um, and so. Uh, while they're busy keeping us in check, and trust me, they ruin a lot of our fun, um, but uh, they definitely are keeping us in check and making sure that we're adhering to um, guidance uh, and, and law, so. Okay, thank you. I, I, do have, I do have a question. It hasn't been mentioned, and I don't know if, if it's relevant in this particular dis discussion and presentation, but we, like Chicago, have a lot of old homes. Prior to 86, there was uh, no restriction on the use of lead pipe going in, in those homes. So we probably, Joliet probably has half of its uh, construction prior to that, that, that time. Um, what are you going to do, what are you going to do in Chicago to assist the homeowner? Because it, the research that I've done says it's about 10 grand to repipe a house. Um, if we just assume that we've got a third that we have to re that, that need to be repiped, I mean, how are, it's a lot. <laughs> right. So how, how are you, how are you going to approach that? How so, is Chicago? So two things that? to that. I think, you know, having Chicago as a water provider, that is something that we deal with every day. And so making sure 
that our coagulants are addressing the lead service lines. And so obviously we see a lot of municipalities that struggle with when you make that change of a water source, that is an extremely complicated uh, process. And so making sure that whatever the changes that we're managing, um, the lining, uh, the coagulants in the pipe to ensure that water, uh, that lead is not leaching through into the water, that is something that we work on every day. And so that is one thing. I will say that we are currently working um, to with CDM Smith, uh, who is doing a national survey for us. They're looking at best practices in terms of if Chicago, if and when Chicago moves forward uh, with a lead service line replacement pro uh, program, how would we do it? What are the best practices in terms of, I mean, everything from community outreach? And so how are you uh, encouraging people to let the city um, tear up your lawn, potentially tear up your basement to replace this lead service line? Um, there are issues with you know people not wanting you to uh, disturb your, their homes, taking time off of work. So the first step is just engaging people and allowing them to, to do this. Uh, then we're looking at construction. And so what are the best, method, best methods and the most cost-effective methods to get this done? And where would we even start? The city's so big. How should we, we start? What would be the priority areas that, would, um, that we could uh, manage this in an effective manner? I think uh, some of the cities around the country that are doing it uh, have, are doing like three to 4,000 lead service line uh, replacements per year. In the city, we have tens of thousands of them. And so trying to figure out what our strategy is gonna be, this is all things that are being worked on and then the financing of it. And so what would the city pay for? What would the community pay for? These are all things that we're hoping to get more information on. And so uh, the report is due to us towards the end of the year and we would be happy to share our best practices with Joliet uh, and, and see how we could help assist you as well in that. I'll just clarify um, for Joliet, uh, lead service lines were banned in the late 30s. So we're in a better situation than uh, say Chicago. Yeah. Yeah, so. um, however, we do have uh, quite a few and we are taking a very proactive approach um, beginning this year, we have a lead service line uh, replacement program, and we're also in the process of applying for a, a low interest loan with principal forgiveness from the state for doing additional lead service line replacement. Um, so we have information on our, on our website. Um, so we are again, taking a very proactive approach and are already in the process of replacing them. Um, I also say that you know the issue of um, switching water sources, again, we're aware is going to be a major component of this project, which is why we're already meeting with US EPA and IEPA next week to begin that conversation so that we don't have uh, the issues that you know happened in, in Flint and recently in University Park. So we're being very proactive with uh, both of those items. I want to be very careful how I, I word this. Um, under the previous mayor, sure. um, the water meter replacement was uh, undertaken. Uh, it's common knowledge. I don't know if best practice was used, okay? I'd like to hear you say you're going to use best practice. Uh, for the life of me, I don't understand how the changing out of a water meter uh, disrupts that passive layer uh, that's that's in that's in the lines that much. Okay, so I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows. And since you have a class action suit, don't comment on it. Okay, I'm I'm just saying Chicago's doing a lot. That's that's all I'm saying. Uh, well, I just want to take this opportunity again to, to thank you for allowing us to come out. Uh, I think uh, this was a great conversation, and we're certainly excited uh, to continue the conversation as you see fit. Uh, as we mentioned, we think that we have a, um, a great team here um, that could uh, certainly benefit the city. We think that we can offer competitive uh, pricing, and um, really we're hoping to uh, provide you with a sort of out-of-the-box a proposal that will really suit the <coughs> residents of Joliet and the region. And we hope to continue this conversation with you and that you'll uh, be our partner. So thank you again. Uh, and we encourage you to reach out to us through Allison if there are any other questions that we can answer for you. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very thank much. You. <clears throat> okay. Um, <coughs> we'll get back 
um, in the order of the agenda. Uh, so I think, Joe, um, you are going to uh, handle education topic 13. Chairman, and, and as Allison said, our, our practice has been to send out the educational topic materials ahead of the meetings, um, not really to go through a lot of detail here. Um, just quickly, the educational topic for this past month was our grants and option. Let me go back. I'm not going to go back to there. It was just one slide, but uh, it was sent out late last week to the committee and posted on the, on the uh, city's website. And just the, the quick takeaway is that Grants are obviously attractive because they provide an external source of funding uh, without requiring payback. Um, however, in this case, for a project of this magnitude, the likelihood that Joliet is going to be able to secure a very large grant that's going to fund a major part of this project is very small. So the, the takeaway really is that grants are something the city will continue to look at in a targeted fashion uh, as part of the overall strategy, certainly if there are opportunities out there for um, energy conservation or, or green infrastructure or purchase of, of land for the project, those are great opportunities. But the likelihood that grants are going to be a major component of the funding strategy is, is very small at this point. So with that, I'll just answer any other questions if there were any regarding that, that topic. Okay. Then we'll move forward. The, the other item that we briefly want to talk about tonight, and again, I think as Allison indicated, the intention tonight is not to make a choice or a decision regarding funding strategies, but to take just a few minutes to talk a little bit about how funding plays into the total cost of water that we've talked about. Um, the direction we've heard from the commission as well as from city council members is when we present the results in November of our, our costs for the different options, there are the capital costs of these improvements but really the metric that, that people are interested in is what's going to be the, the net effect to customers, what's going to be the change in the cost of water to customers. To understand that, we have to have some consideration of how funding and financing may fit into the project. This is not, again, to say we're making a decision. That's clearly a decision that is responsibility of the City Council and the City of Joliet. But to be able to get to, a, a, to provide that metric, we have to make some assumptions. So tonight I just very quickly want to talk about the major options that, that go into funding <coughs> of large infrastructure projects. Um, and, and again, this is really more of an educational item for the group. Details will be talked about more when we present the overall costs. Um, there are really four primary buckets, if you will, of, of funds that municipal water utilities generally use to fund their infrastructure projects. There are state and federal grants and loans. And as I said, there are a variety of programs. There are some grants, but in general, the grants are very targeted. There are municipal bonds, which are one of the most common financing tools used by communities, where community basically borrows money and agrees to pay it back over time. There are public-private partnerships. Uh, these are a little bit less common. Um, they're used typically more in transportation projects, but they're starting to gain some traction in, in other areas. And this is an arrangement where, where a municipality and a private entity will partner to finance, develop a project. Um, and then there are regional partnerships where, where one community may team up with other communities and share the cost and spread that out. Just, I'll run through each of these very quickly, again, just to kind of provide a highlight. The, the, the box, they're, they're kind of four, if you will, characteristics of each of these options that we've, we've classified. And the box on the upper right-hand side of each of, these si uh, each of the slides kind of provides a high level assessment of those. So there's, there's some effort to secure the type of funding that you're using. There are the financing costs. Some options obviously have lower costs than others. There are compliance and regulatory requirements. Some funding sources require you to do a fair amount of, of monitoring and reporting on that. And then there's external control. Some funding options, um, some of that control that you have over the project is, is perhaps traded away uh, for other benefits. So federal and state loans and grants, the, the advantage is these generally provide a relatively low financing cost, depending on the option or the program. Um, the disadvantages are sometimes there are limitations on how much funding is available, and generally they do come with some reporting and, and application requirements. You have to apply, perhaps compete for the money, and then report on how you use it. Uh, two examples of this that may be relevant for Joliet going forward. 
There is a program operated or administered by the US EPA called WIFIA, the Water Infrastructure Financing and Innovation Act. So this is a government program that was initiated in about 2014 that is specifically targeted towards large projects. Um, in fact, for larger communities, a project has to cost more than $20 million to be even considered in this program. It is a loan program, it is a, a credit program, it's not a grant, uh, but typically provides competitive uh, low rates that are tied to U.S. Treasury rates for financing. They typically provide a, a relatively long period of payback, so up to 35 years, so it allows you to spread the costs out over time. And there, are some, there is some flexibility in the payback periods. They will allow you perhaps up to five years after your project is completed before you can start making repayments. So they will defer the repayment program. <coughs> the second government program that's widely used and that Joliet uses for some other projects already is what's called the Revolving Fund Loan Program or the, the Public Water Supply Loan Program. Uh, this is administered by the Illinois EPA and there are similar programs in all 50 states. But again, it's a low interest program that is designed to help communities afford infrastructure improvements. So there's an application process, um, community is, is selected, put on an int intended use plan, and then when the project comes up and is bid, there's a program that provides some low interest funding. We've had some discussions with Illinois EPA. They currently expect their overall funding for this program for the foreseeable future to be in the range of about $250 million per year that they have to spread out among projects. Uh, they're currently talking about caps, what is the maximum they would allocate to any given project, and they're discussing something on the order of 20%. So it is feasible that a community could get as much as $50 million from this revolving loan fund program in a given year, and potentially then come back in multiple years in the case of a longer term project. Um, so that is another, another example of a, of a federal loan or a state loan. Um, as I mentioned before, municipal bonds are a common mechanism that, that municipalities use to fund uh, large projects. Again, the advantage here is you have a lot of control over this. You don't have to uh, go out and, and apply for this. The, the city can make a decision to issue bonds, go through a bonding process. Um, disadvantage is that typically the costs are a little bit higher. There's some issuance costs that go into setting up the bonds and then those bonds are sold on the market. You may have to pay a little bit higher interest rate to attract people to purchase those bonds. Um, but it is a common, a common tool that's available to municipalities and, and used for large projects. Public-private partnerships, as, as I mentioned before, are a little bit more rare. Um, the, the key takeaway here, I think, really relates to risk. In most public-private partnerships, the primary advantage is that the private partner is willing, in most cases, to assume some of the risks. So for example, on a large infrastructure project, a private partner may bring the capital and say, we will build this project for you um, and assume the risks associated with construction and variations, you know, possible fluctuations in construction costs. Um, and, then, and then there's an agreement by which uh, there, is a, there is a participation on the part of the municipality that may be a payback over time, it may be take a lot of different structures. Uh, but the intent is that there's a risk transfer where the private partner shares some of the risk. Uh, the municipality then, if you will, pays a little bit of a premium for that Just private that partner to bring that capital in early on and assume that risk. Uh, so in this case, there is more work to secure the, pro uh, the, uh, the, the public excuse me, public-private financing, because you've got to work out that agreement negotiated. Uh, the financing costs tend to be a little bit higher, and you do give up some control over the project, because you may give that control to someone else. In return, you get the benefit of, of them taking on some of the risks. And lastly is, is regional partnering. Again, this is an option where, where Joliet partners up with other communities, and if, if you want to think of it as an economy of scale, you have multiple partners, you can spread the cost out a little bit and the cost to each individual partner is lower. Um, the challenge in this type of model, I think is, as we've talked about before, is there has to be a mechanism to bring the partners together. There has to be a driver to get people to commit and come together in the, in the development of the project. And, and I think right now in our discussions around the Joliet Water Project, a lot of people are kind of waiting to see what Joliet decides to do uh, before they're able to kind of make a decision about how that may fit in. Uh, but this is still obviously an option that's on the table. 
I'm not going to go through the details of this, but this is a matrix that just kind of summarizes the, 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 uh, the challenges <coughs> and, uh, and the um, benefits of, of the different options. And this is spelled out, will be spelled out more in detail in the appendix that goes through our final report. Um, in general, in this matrix, high indicates is, is high is bad. So high effort to secure, high financing costs are bad. Uh, low would be generally favorable. Um, we would expect, though, as Joliet goes forward, that you're going to need to apply some mix of these options to finance the overall project. It's unlikely that one of these is necessarily going to be the silver bullet that, that drives the project forward. Um, for the purpose of developing our costs, and again, this is not to say this is a recommended strategy, but for the purpose of, of presenting our costs and, and looking at how financing will fit into the total cost of water, um, our intent is to assume that Joliet would pursue and be successful in getting some WIFIA funding that would come at about a 2 to 3% interest rate over 35 years, and that that could fund up to 49% of the project, um, that there would be some additional uh, public water supply loan funding that would be available to the city. Um, it would also come at a relatively low interest rate, a little shorter time frame, a little uh, more rapid payback period there. And, and then that the balance that's not covered by those would then be covered with revenue bonds. Current rates on revenue bonds are very competitive or relatively low. Um, I can't guarantee that they will be that way in five to 10 years. And so we have to be a little bit careful about, about how we present that. But the, our intention is to have a consistent basis for estimating the financing costs that go into all of the options so that we do give you a, a picture of the total cost of the project. Again, but without necessarily we're not trying to, uh, to commit Joliet to any certain strategy. With that, I'll answer any questions you have about, about the funding analysis that's been done so far. Otherwise, like I say, we'll present the details and the numbers when we present the overall uh, cost for the various alternatives. So I have a question, just a little clarification too. It, it sounds to me that we're going to be using multiple sources of funding options. For the, again, for the purpose of, of estimating our, our impacts across or comparing the alternatives right now, that's the assumption that we're making. Um, that's again, Joliet could, well, let me back up. None of the government loan programs, neither WIFIA nor the state water supply revolving fund, Cover have enough cost. capacity to finance the whole program. So if you were going to use those for a portion of it, you would have to have other components. Uh, a public private partnership could potentially finance the whole program. So, um, so could the revenue reasons. bonds as well, then? I'm sorry? For, so could the revenue bonds? Absolutely. As well. Revenue bonds, could, the city could bond the whole project as well. Joe, you're always spot on. <laughs> I'm going to read from the Washington Post. It's dated 2000, you know, 2017. Federal funding for water infrastructure has fallen 74% in real terms since 1977, and low interest government loans have not filled the gap. Trump's budget would reduce federal aid for water projects. It eliminates 498 million loan program, 49, $498 million in loan programs that help fund water projects. It adds only four million or less than a half percent to the state revolving funds, considering one of the government's most successful programs for local water projects. This means that the revolving fund for drinking water would have the lowest budget in real terms since the program began in 1997, according to the Congressional Research Service. And I think multiple sources is the key word that right. you presented. The, the only comment I will add to that, we did have a discussion with the, the Illinois EPA and the, the folks that run the program. And a key word in that loan program is revolving loans. The way that program works is in, in the <coughs> early years, the state used seed money to finance those projects. But those communities that borrowed money in the early years of the program are paying it back. And in general, municipalities are very good repayers. They, they pay back their loans. And so that's why Illinois has said they are very confident that they will have on the order of $250 million a year to make available to for water infrastructure improvements across the state over the near term. Now, obviously, $250 million spread across the whole state doesn't, may not go, not everybody's going to get what they want. 
Um, but it is, a, it is certainly a, an attractive source to be considered. Okay? Thank you. So with that, I think uh, the last topic Jeff is going to cover, talk about water transmission and distribution. All right, thank you, Joe, and for those of you who thought you were going to get through a meeting without me talking, and I apologize. <laughs> uh, good news is I only have four slides uh, beyond this first one. So, um, as you may be aware, waterworks systems are essentially a series of interconnected pipes, uh, most of which you don't even see. They're underneath the ground, are typically running along the street. Uh, those pipes are connected to the water production site, so where water is treated and then pumped into those pipes. Those pipes are connected to the water storage facilities. Those are often things you do see, like the water towers that are up in the air, or in some cases reservoirs or, or tanks that are at ground level that need pumps to pump into those pipes. The pipes are also um, often connected with some pumps internally because in some cases water needs to be transferred from one pressure zone to another and it pumps through those pipes to get them uh, to those higher pressure zones. And then those pipes also connect to the water service lines that ultimately come into houses, businesses, industries and institutions uh, throughout the overall water work system. In some cases, the transmission pipes and distribution pipes are one and the same. And convey the water to all of the connected components. In other cases, they need to be separate to be able to move the water hydraulically across the entire system to be able to get that water into a service line at an appropriate pressure and then meet the demands at the faucet. We're going to talk about the difference between transmission and distribution pipes again. In some cases, they're the same. Actually, in the city's existing system, they are one and the same. However, in many or almost all of the alternatives that you're looking at for the different supply, they are going to be different. Uh, transmission in general is that pipe that is going to transmit the water from one point to another. It's getting it from that production site to the points where it makes sense, hydraulically within the system, to ultimately distribute it. Typically, the transmission pipes are larger in diameter, 16 inch is almost always the minimum on that transmission. We could be talking pipes that are 24 inch, or even you know, 48, et cetera, depending on how far it has to go. In many cases, those transmission pipes are just one line or maybe a couple lines, but they're not looped. They're not interconnected. That's not the case with distribution, as we'll see. Often, again, those transmission mains don't have water services. Uh, the water services typically connect to the distribution pipes, and there will be minimal connection so that when pressure is generated to move that water, it can get to the points along the way distribute that water into those areas uh, ultimately. And then there's less head loss because you don't have all those fittings connected, so you don't have all those services, so we can take advantage of larger pipes, less friction in those pipes, and we can move the water across the system uh, to typically storage facilities or other pumping stations. On the flip side, distribution, uh, the main focus there is often it's smaller diameter pipes. So. Uh, you're trying to meet with the distribution those demands locally again at the water service that's connected to it um, it also typically connects to the fire hydrants there if you need to fight a fire overall uh, we intentionally loop those mains so that we can take advantage of multiple routes of that water moving around the system ultimately less friction more ways to get the water to areas where it's needed as well uh, it's interconnected at crossings the water service are connected to the uh, distribution mains, again, not with the transmission. And there's typically more head loss because you do have uh, often 90s, T's, fire hydrants, services that are all connected to them. Under the cities of Joliet's existing system, uh, if you've probably talked about this many times, you have 26 wells that provide the source water to your system. Uh, some of those wells uh, go together to a water treatment plant where the water is treated and then sent into the what is actually now your transmission and distribution system. In some of those cases, there's only one well 
that goes into what is uh, often the transmission or what is the transmission and distribution system. One of the huge benefits of your current system is the 11 water treatment plants that you have are spread all across your system. So you're producing water on the east side, on the west side, in the, in the north, in the central, in the south. You're pumping that water out of the ground. It goes through the treatment plant. In many cases, the uh, energy that was used to pump it out of the, the ground is used to pass through that treatment system and go out into the distribution system and then send that water not only to the storage tanks but also to the services that are connected, the fire hydrants, et cetera. Because you have that distribution of production across your whole system, there's no need uh, to have independent transmission mains within, even though your system's very large, there's no need to have the independent transmission main. However, when we're talking about all these alternatives, we're gonna produce that water, essentially have it available for uh, going into your overall water system, typically at, at one location as a starting point. And um, there's two general locations that have been defined, either on the east side of the community, which is shown here as, a, as an option, at the Fairmont and Garvin uh, pump station. There's some storage reservoirs there as well. <coughs> or on the far west side of the community at Ridge Road. So uh, many of the Lake Michigan alternatives, for instance, that are coming from the north and east would come bring that treated water to Fairmont and Garvin. And then we have to find a way to get that water out across your whole system uh, to be able to provide pressure at an appropriate rate, uh, flow and rate to uh, each one of the connected pipes in the system. So just think about it. If you have all that water coming in the east side and you need to pump it all the way to the west side, you would have to jack up the pressure pretty high if you were trying to send it through that distribution system. The folks on the east side would have really high pressure just to be able to squeeze it through all the pipes and get to the west side. We solve that by putting in an independent transmission main that doesn't connect to those facilities on the east side, doesn't have that high pressure on the east side. It can convey that water to storage tanks that are spread throughout the system, including all the way to the west side. Same holds true if the water comes in the west side and then pushes <coughs> to the east side. One of the main reasons why we're talking about this is this is a significant cost. So we're, we're you know, we're focused a lot on the fact that no matter what alternative we're looking at, there's gonna be a cost to get that treated water to the system. But once we get it to Joliet, there's gonna be a pretty significant cost to get it across your system too. And you are saying that doesn't matter where we get the water from, this is necessary. Exactly, going from east to west, west to east uh, ultimately you know it probably doesn't make a huge difference within the alternatives because you have to find a way and ultimately water can go in either direction friction doesn't really care if it's going west or east you need large diameter pipes to transmit it how can you determine all of this if you don't know where the water will be coming from so we're we, we as in the consultant team, and, and actually uh, Crawford Murphy and Tilly is the consultant that's working on this primarily, has a uh, computer uh, model of the whole water system uh, distribution and is integrating the transmission pipes into that model. They're evaluating alternatives where 30 MGD is coming to Fairmont and Garvin and then determining how that would be distributed to the west. So again, that would be uh, where the Lake Michigan alternatives generally are being perceived to come into the system. To where? To Fairmount and Garvin. Fairmount and Garvin. Which is the location that it says a proposed receiving station. Uh, there is, uh, for instance, the Illinois River options that being coming from the west or south, considering going to the Ridge Road standpipe, which is on Ridge Road, uh, by the high school there. And then that would be using the model to see how the, what improvements are required to distribute that water to the east. Is there an estimated cost? Working on it. It's, it's along with uh, all the other other costs. Um, so they, they will be part of the total cost of water that we present for all the different alternatives. But we wanted to give you the basis tonight uh, to just show you how we're going to work, how we work that through. Yes, sir. Good. Yes, okay. Sir. Um, I was always taught that every tool in the tool chest 
has a function. And everything in our infrastructure has a function. And what I would like to know is in all of this proposed transmission, and I understand in certain specific instances, you have to use things that you wouldn't use in other instances, okay? So what I would like to know is, is in the estimates for this transmission and or Chicago, are there any plans to use HDPE pipe in water transmission or any type of water main? So I, I are, are those in the cost estimates? Um, there can be. I don't know that we're going down to that 100% level of detail as part of this study overall. That would be, in my opinion, a refinement within the next phase is to evaluate the very specific types of pipes in particular locations. Uh, HDPE is often used in, in trench list technologies. Uh, so in, in some cases there are crossings where that might be appropriate. In other cases, ductile iron pipe makes sense. Uh, in other cases, pre-stressed concrete pipe might make sense, all depending on the diameter and the economics related to it. Uh, again, as part of the preliminary engineering, once an alternative is selected, I think the pipe material will be fine-tuned. We've made assumptions um, for the cost estimating for materials, and Joe, I, if you can just speak to what we're assuming. So for the transmission mains, the mains that would bring water from the, the point of supply to Joliet, for the 30 to 6, 30 or 60 MGD alternatives, these are large diameter mains. They're generally in the range of 48 inches to 54 inches to 60 inches in diameter. So four or five, yeah, four, four <laughs> and a half, five feet, sorry. Um, but large pipes. And, and our experience has been when you get into those diameters, that generally steel or uh, pre-stressed concrete cylinder pipe are, are the most cost effective. What we see a lot of communities do on large transmission main projects is when you actually put out your bid documents, you may give the contractor the, the option to bid alternate materials. So we can provide a design for what would be the required steel pipe, what would be the required concrete pipe, what would be you know, something else and actually have the contractor give us prices for pipes that would meet the same standard to see what's most economical. Um, as Jeff said, HDPE is often used if we've got like a major river crossing where we're, where we're tunneling or directionally drilling under something. So that would come into the mix there. But to Allison's question, the short answer is for our cost estimates right now, for the large diameter pipe, it's being based on, on concrete pipe, on pre-stressed concrete cylinder pipe. And that's, again, consistent across the board so that we have a, a consistent basis for comparing the alternatives. And not, you know, I, here again, I'm not the engineer like you are, okay, but we all get phone calls in that, okay? So let me just, you know, go down the list here, okay? Um, the victim's fund of a billion dollars has been used up in the lawsuit against DuPont and Shell for the poly black pipe that was used uh, for a lot of water, actually six million structures in the United States. Um, they list polyethylene as subject to freeze thaw patterns, damage from ground pressure. But here again, it has a use if you have to go underwater or you have to make a 90 degree turn, okay? Uh, polybutylene deteriorates from the inside and um, there's been an issue with contaminants, and I think we're all concerned about contaminants in our water. And then the only concrete company that I know in the area that makes the pre-stressed concrete discontinued it because it could maintain a pressure for sanitary lines, but it couldn't maintain a pressure for water lines. And, and just the added issue of when you run that in areas of roadways, uh, the salt will leach down through the ground and basically corrode the metal wrappings. Do I, I have no opinion on this, okay? But I got the question. No, and, and the, so the, just to clarify on concrete, there are lots of different types of concrete pipes. So concrete pipe is commonly used for storm sewers. Right. So if you see storm sewers going, that's what we would call a reinforced concrete pipe. 
and that has reinforcing steel in it right. and then concrete poured around it. That is pipe that's suitable for gravity conditions where it's not pressurized. Right. Uh, the pipe that's generally used for transmission main is something called pre-stressed concrete cylinder pipe. So it actually is a steel cylinder that is encased in concrete, both on the outside and the inside, and it is rated for pressure. It's widely used in the East and Western United States. There was a period of time, um, so there was a period of 70s, I, I would have to, but there was a period of time where there were some problems with the manufacture of that concrete pipe and people started moving away from it. That has, has been changed, the technology, the quality assurance has come back. But again, we're not, our intent is not to determine today what the material is going to be for Joliet. I think we would encourage you as you go into final design to consider either alternate bids or, or an evaluation at that point of the materials and how they fit. Sure, thank you. I think we have a question. Uh. Okay, Bruce Redwick again. Um, I see on the east side, it looks like almost Essington Road or to Essington Road, you do have a loop. Okay, for the transmission system. After that, you go on a long radial lead to the far west side. I assume you're going to supply the far west side in case that lead breaks with the wells out there on a temporary basis. What would it take to bring another lead under I-55? That seems to me that, that and the river would be the two toughest points to cross, just to have a loop so that if you were to have a pipe break or something was to happen on one side, you could valve it around and move the water the other. As I stated to start with, uh, CMT is doing this analysis with their staff. Uh, Teresa's out of town this evening, so I'm, I'm pinch hitting here overall. Um, and, and she can certainly answer this in, in greater detail when she's available. Uh, what I will say is, is typically when you're doing an analysis like this, uh, you will look at those scenarios if the transmission main goes down and evaluate if the distribution system, for instance, can pick up uh, from that point to be able to transmit the water. Uh, so for instance, you know, if it breaks west of 55 and you've got water in storage tanks that are, are at least close to 55 and the distribution mains that are under 55 have large enough diameter to be able to continue to that, move that water west, uh, that may be good enough. Uh, if you think about you know, kind of the north-south portion of the system, uh, on the east of 55, that, that's, I'm guessing, the primary reason why there's two transmission mains there. One that kind of hits the northern area, one the south. As you get further west, the community gets more confined north-south overall, and therefore uh, one transmission may, may, may be able to connect to enough storage facilities such that the distribution system can make up the hydraulics. Like I said, uh, if I said anything wrong, I'm sure Teresa's uh, going to watch this and she'll correct me later. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Oh, I have another question. Sorry, I'm late. Can you come to the microphone to or the TV? Go on from that. This gets into the land use plan the city is undertaking. How does the proposed, I'm assuming the Siamers capacities take into account maybe the build out projection of the existing Joliet land use plan? If there is a land use plan that council approves, say that expands the service area, especially to the south, and increases population, how does that, is there capacity in this to accommodate that different land form in the land use plan? I would say most likely yes. Uh, it's pretty standard practice when you're doing the distribution system modeling like this, transmission and distribution, is to put in the existing demands on the system, uh, which the model was built previously, I'm sure they're in there, as well as the future demands. So uh, typically you'll look, for instance, to the west where there might be a lot of growth, and, and as Joe stated, to the south uh, where there might be growth and put nodes in the 
distribution system model to take up you know, that additional demand that would be in the future to make sure that you can convey that water to those areas. I'll just say it's, it's good timing that they're doing the comprehensive plan, you know, in the next two years. That'll tie in nicely for when we start going into that level of detailed design that we can accommodate that planning. Okay. Which is a very good point. I mean, this is based on the knowledge that we have now, but over time it will be refined and, and improved. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Um, Water Conservation Subcommittee Report, Maria. All right, so to give us an update, um, we on our uh, toilet rebate program, the city has inspected 35 uh, toilets, 20 were eligible, and seven have been completed to date. So that means um, if you remember that our toilets are approximately 49% 40, uh, of the water usage, that is seven toilets that are changed already. Our rain barrel, uh, program that we subsidize, 120 have been subsidized uh, so far, and I know that that's probably going to die down as our weather is changing. We are also working on some ordinance revisions that we'll hopefully be able to share in the next meeting or so, uh, or when we get to a meeting that we can share about some of the things that we're looking to do, uh, the city is looking to do to modify the ordinances with water conservation in mind. And then we are consistently working on partnerships, long-term partnerships with many of our stakeholders, um, most recently District 86, and we're gonna be providing hopefully some long-term um, education and outreach opportunities uh, throughout the community that will, you know, start now and continue until 2025, 2030, when we uh, do finally have our, our water source. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, old business, I think Wayne had something. Uh, John had something. Sure. Um, in August, um, I brought forth Dr. Laura Condon's um, paper on um, the effects on rivers and streams with depleting aquifers. Uh, last week in National Geographic, October 2nd, uh, there is another published uh, study, uh, very interesting comments. There is no formula to calculate how to replenish aquifers, in my opinion. 40% uh, of the food we grow is watered by aquifers, uh, and it's uh, being depleted faster than it can be replenished. So National Geographic, um, pretty good story. Um, uh, going back to the Dresden Pool, uh, just recently published uh, is Chicago water pollution halting a silver, uh, silver carp invasion? Uh, this came from the University of Manitoba. They came down. And uh, here again, I submit this for reading purposes. Um, the one thing is that this fish, the Asian carp, and the silver variety, it's mentioned multiple times. They don't stop for anything. There's something stopping them, and uh, that's interesting. Um, the last ones uh, I'll bring up, uh, and I want to be uh, extremely careful um, how I say this. Um, we've been given a number of times, um, and it's been mentioned a number of times, that Peoria and uh, uh, the Illinois River, they get their water from the Illinois River. And they've been getting their water from the Illinois River since 1889 just like Chicago's been getting water from Lake Michigan or whatever. But if I had to make this into a story, like Dr. Seuss, you know, I would say all is not happy in Whoville, okay? So the first article um, is, is entitled, Peorians Deserve Their Water Back. They get their water from the Illinois River through Illinois American and I firmly believe that the city council and the mayor are 
a thousand percent correct in anything that we do with water has a contractual agreement that benefits the people of Joliet. Um, every five years in Peoria, this becomes a very divisive issue. And studies that they've done show that um, private companies um, just don't respond as well. And I wouldn't put Chicago in this or DuPage Water Commission, but the private companies just do not respond the way they should. Um, so those are interesting, um, interesting stories, and they're all current, 2017, 18, 19, okay? The other one concerns uh, headline, nasty pollutants in Peoria drinking water put your health at risk. Um, what I find interesting here is uh, the PhD that contributed this says what's legal in water isn't necessarily safe when it comes to your drinking water, okay? And essentially what they say is that even the federal EPA, but even the uh, Illinois EPA, um, they haven't done much with standards in over two decades, okay? And, and that's, uh, and that's uh, their opinion. Now, the last one is Peoria tap water assessments. And here again, it comes from the Illinois River. And as far as I know, Illinois American is a top-notch company, okay? And they've tried, and they've tried, and they've tried uh, to help, okay? And I find it interesting that they use the chloramination similar to what Aqua uses, and they both, you know, use river sources, okay? And in using this, they get a high rate of disinfecting byproducts, byproducts that are from the disinfecting process, okay? And you know, we could have a discussion for a long time, but it just comes down to this. Illinois Americans spent $24 million. $24 million to put in a ultraviolet light um, disinfecting system into the water system there. $24 million. And I guess the questions come up, why would you spend $24 million if you didn't have to? And what's in the water that you have to spend $24 million that chloramination was not correcting? Okay? And I think these could, you know, serve for some discussion. And the last comment is that any of these articles you read, they talk about in-home filtration systems. Now, Mayor Lightfoot there spending 19 million because of the higher lead levels, okay? But Joliet having a population, and Wayne mentioned it, of older homes, senior citizens, poor people, okay? A socioeconomic uh, level of people that they don't have $10,000 to redo those pipelines, and they don't have four grand to put in a filtration system. And uh, that's why I bring it to the attention of everybody here for discussion purposes at any time. Thank you. Well, I think it's a reasonable question. It's, so they're using an, an additional uh, filtration or, or uh, decontamination technology that Chicago isn't even using, that's the, U, the ultraviolet, right? Um, do the experts here know like what that decontaminates that every other process doesn't take care of or? So that's part of the purpose of our river water sampling program is to uh, identify what is in the water. That information was presented to IEPA and we're just waiting for their feedback on what treatment methods would be required. Um, <coughs> I'll have Joe or Jeff they wanna. Right, it, let me just add this Joe, okay. Um, and this is my understanding uh, commissioner. Um, 
when the water samples from the USG report are taken, or any samples are taken, the USG does the sample taking using their methodology and provides it for the Illinois EPA. So, you know, if you take a quart of water, you give half to the Illinois EPA, and the USGS keeps half. Why is that important? It's important because they go to different labs. And now what you have is essentially a double blind study, mm -hmm. okay, of the area, okay? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Joe. I just... Uh, well, I, I don't know the specifics of Peoria's system, but just, just, I guess, to clarify a little bit. So disinfection byproducts, as the commissioner mentioned, is what happens in certain circumstances if there are compounds in the water uh, that react with chlorine, mm. you can create these byproducts. Um, this has been known for some time, and there is actually a, a regulation called the Disinfectant Byproduct Rule um, that limits the levels of those uh, byproducts <coughs> that can occur in a water system. In some cases, uh, communities may decide that the best way to deal with that is to switch their method of disinfection. Chlorination is a method of disinfection. If they switch from chlorination to UV light, UV light does not produce disinfectant byproducts. So if there is something in the water that makes it vulnerable to the byproducts, then an easy way, rather than trying to figure out how to make this not occur, I won't say an easy way, but an alternative to addressing that is just to switch the, the disinfection method to UV light. I suspect that that's, like I said, I don't know the details of Peoria, but I suspect that that was the, the premise of So we're, we're inferring there's something that reacts not so positively with chlorine, maybe in the Peoria source. And, right, and it right. depends on the, the concentration of those, what they call precursors, the things that react. So, and again, this is all, those precursors are certainly in the sample set that, right. that's been collected. If I may continue then, Joe, because you mentioned, mentioned something uh, uh, here again. Um, showing the disinfecting byproducts um, and taking trihalomethanes as an example. Okay, to give you an example, uh, the health guideline is 0.8. So it's kind of like a breathalyzer. It's, it's 0.8 uh, parts per billion. Uh, the national, excuse me, the state average is 26.7 and Peoria is 34.4. So, what they're saying here is that, here again, there's stuff in the water that's reacting with the chloramination because they switched to chloramination just like Aqua did, okay? Had a bad response trying to reduce the chloramination and they spent 24 million on ultraviolet lights, okay? That's all it's saying. points. I mean, as Joe stated, there are multiple ways to skin the cat relative to disinfection. Uh, chlorine is an option. Uh, you can actually go with what to call breakpoint chlorine, chlorination, and that would be simply just adding the chlorine overall um, and getting past breakpoint and then taking all the ammonia out, which is what the city of Chicago uses. Uh, chloramination is an option where you essentially use a combination of ammonia and chlorine, and in some instances that's actually better. Uh, Elgin, for instance, uses chloramination. The city of Aurora uses chloramination. It's not uncommon for actually inland surface water sources to use chloramination. In some cases, chloramination can produce less disinfection byproducts than going to free chlorine because when you're going to free chlorine, you're actually adding more chlorine uh, to the water in some instances. You have to, uh, based on IEPA standards and based on what is in the water and the sampling will tell you, you know, ultimately what level of disinfection you need to do. You need to apply the methods that, that meet their regs. In some cases, that's UV plus chlor chloramination. In some cases, that might be going after it with ozone uh, as an alternative disinfection. Uh, within, you know, these uh, water supplies, we're setting up the appropriate level of disinfection for the water that uh, is brought in, the costs associated with those, uh, such that they can then be compared on an equal basis. Right, no, I never said you weren't. I, I'm just bringing this forth, and I think there's also a comment in there that ultraviolet light is probably one of the most expensive ways, um, you know, to disinfect water. And it's, you know, and here again, it, it's only been done in Illinois like twice, 
okay? Yeah, so water. I gotta believe that there's extraordinary circumstances to spend $24 million and use uh, ultraviolet light and only be the second ones in the state to use it. There has to be some circumstances that, that, that deserves, you know, a, a better look by somebody like you. Sure, definitely. And I will say on the wastewater side, actually you're required to disinfect the water before it goes back into the receiving stream. And UV disinfection is used all the time on the wastewater side. It's not until mm. recently that they're testing it out well, on the drinking water. Side. Yeah, not at the Stickney plant, but at the O'Brien plant uh, it is. You are correct. Um, if we could, um, because you cited a number of articles, um, if we could, if, if it's okay with you to provide those to staff so that they can be distributed to the commissioners and, and also be subject to FOIA and anybody that would want to look at it. And Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> so um, I just... I thought the Asian carp one was particularly interesting. Well, what caught my eye in the Asian carp is you see all the Asian carp flapping? That's the Fox River. That's not down here. Right, That's right. That's the Fox. Um, okay, thank you for uh, providing that information. Just one, one announcement before we adjourn. Um, we did find a red folder at the last meeting, so if anyone left a red folder or know who might have a red folder, it's on the back table. Um, so just wanted to make that announcement. Thank you. Uh, any further uh, comments from the public? Any further comments from the commission? Well, do we have, oh. we have, we have, uh, yeah. Sorry, I want to say real quick. Sorry. I was roughly today, and this gets to public relations, the short turnaround between November 13th and December 5th, the public forum, and if November 13th is the first time that Phase 2 will be out in the open, I would encourage the city and this group, Harold, to have a very aggressive plan for how you're going to make that document available for the public forum. Acknowledging between those dates, you've got Thanksgiving and people being gone, but just giving people a chance to digest all that information and try to participate on December 5th, that's a very short. So I would think hopefully there's an aggressive campaign to let people know here it is, go get it, and et cetera. And I think that'll save you and others comments in December about why didn't I know, why didn't I, because that is a very short turnaround for a mat, well, I'm assuming it's going to be a massive document. Mm -hmm. so. Noted. Motion to adjourn. Um, there's been a motion to adjourn by uh, Commissioner Herco. Second. Uh, second by Com Ms. Commissioner Coffin. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Meeting adjourned. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Yeah. So